be seated. Grace and joy to you, family. It's the first year of Jesus' earthly ministry, and it's commonly called the year of popularity. Jesus has been preaching and teaching all over the region of Galilee. People are flocking from all around to hear this field preacher from Nazareth proclaim the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And in today's story, Jesus is literally at a party. It's a party that's been thrown by one of his new disciples whose name is Levi. Levi comes from a tradition of tax collecting. And in my little chocolate church, we just call him a hustler. <laughs> he worked for the Roman government, oppressing his own people by taking more than he was supposed to. But when he heard Jesus, a change came over him. He dropped his tax collecting practices and decided to follow the rabbi who was preaching about the kingdom of God. And when he came to Jesus, he was so moved with the master that he threw a party. And guess who he invited? The people who were just like him. I like this text today. It's one of my favorites because it says he invited all the sinners. Somebody say all of them. And the tax collectors, which means they weren't just tax collecting sinners. There was a who's who of sinners who was at this party. Don't laugh because you've been at some of them parties too. What makes this text so powerful is that Jesus is there. It gives you a picture of our God, our Savior, and how he loves those who are ostracized, those who are on the outskirts, and those who are not just a part of religious organizations. He is at this party, and at the party, he is then accosted by the religious crowd. Now, the religious crowd has a problem with a rabbi who hangs out with sinners. And so that's where they begin to question if this man truly was a rabbi, then he'll know who he's hanging with. They didn't say this to Jesus in his face, but he overheard their ear hustle. Can I talk to you today? And when he overhears them, he begins to teach them this parable. Now, there are three things that I think uh, we can look at today to help us better understand the parable of the Good Shepherd. One of those things is that the Good Shepherd receives sinners. The Good Shepherd, he rescues sinners. And the Good Shepherd, he rejoices over sinners. So let's unpack this as we go. Feel free to say amen wherever you feel like jumping in. The Bible says in verse 1 that then all, somebody say all, all, all of the tax collectors and all of the sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. Beloved, when you come to this first portion of the parable, the first thing we see is that all of the tax collectors and the sinners felt comfortable drawing near to Jesus. Right. You see, tax collectors in that day were what you and I would call notorious thieves and robbers. They were Jewish by culture, but they worked for the Roman government to oppress their own people. The scholars believe that tax collectors and sinners were simply at this party because Levi told them, you've got to come meet Jesus. And I like that right there. You see, that's important because it takes a sinner to tell another sinner where good news is being taught. Can I say it like I feel it today? The Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, look at Jesus' complaint. He receives sinners, and he's eating with them. 
And I think this is a good place, Wheaton, to remind us, for those of us who want to live like Jesus, that if you've got time for sinners, if you've got time for the ostracized, if you have a love for those who are outside the Wheaton bubble, who are outside of religious systems, then the Pharisees and scribes of today gonna talk about you too. Family, I need to challenge you today as you get ready to go into a world that is in opposition to what we believe. If you're going to be the church that looks like Jesus, that acts like Jesus, that talks like Jesus, you got to receive those that Jesus would receive. That means sinners come in all kinds of shapes, all colors, all sizes all demographics, all economic and social statuses. So no matter who they are, no matter what their strongholds are, what their problems are, you've got to be willing to receive them. I'm hunting for an amen right there. Story is told by Ann Voskamp, who wrote the book, The Broken Way. Sister Ann was one day in church when she overheard her pastor talking in his sermon and giving a joke about once living next to a loony bin. Anne says that when she heard her pastor over the pulpit make light of mental illness, it broke her heart. You see, she was bearing at that time cut marks on her wrist. She was bearing at that time just having to have dropped her mom off at a mental institution. And when the congregation laughed at the brokenness and the unfortunate joke of the pastor, it crushed her heart. And said in that book, I wanted to yell out, Angelus, Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for those who were broken. She said, when they laugh, I felt the blood drain from my body. And I want to argue for Sister Ann right here today. She was right. I want to echo for her today. Listen, Jesus didn't come for those who didn't need a doctor. He came for people like me who were sick, who needed a savior. The good shepherd has come to receive people. And I need to serve us notice so we don't get amnesia. When the church isn't on the side of the suffering or the broken or the mentally ill, they ain't on the side of Jesus. The wounds in his side are for those who are suffering and for those who are broken. The nails that were in his hands are for those who are sinners, not for people who got it all together. He receives everybody, and everybody is being recruited by him because everybody is loved by him. So we must be careful, beloved, how we write off those that we deem less than worthy. Can I get a witness right there? We've looked at the shepherd who receives. Let me show you now the shepherd who rescues. The Bible says in verse 3, when Jesus overheard that, so he spoke this parable to them saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Family, in this parable, Jesus, as the good shepherd, teaches this story about one who is responsible for caring for a flock of sheep. He says, if you have a hundred and you lose one, which one of you would not leave the ninety-nine to go after the one that's lost. What a powerful parable to launch into this with. You see, it's powerful because everybody at that party 
would have understood exactly what Jesus was talking about. Secondly, we discover here that it was not uncommon for sheep to wander into dangerous locations, locations that would be filled with beasts and obstacles that they would not be able to escape from. You see, in Palestine back then, they didn't have restraining walls around their sheep, uh, places where their sheep dwelled. And sheep had to dwell oftentimes in dangerous location. Secondly, I want to remind us that sheep as creatures are naturally directionless. Did you know that? They, they live their lives by their appetite. You've never seen a sheep looking up and asking questions. They always go and graze by their appetite. And so if you've ever noticed them, uh, sometimes it's their appetites that lead them into unsuspecting danger. All right. yeah. Jesus is telling the parable because it was common knowledge that sheep naturally go astray. Prophet Isaiah told us this. However, when they go astray, oh, yes. it's good to know that a good shepherd will leave the majority of the flock and find the one who has wandered off. Can I let you in the text for a little bit? Shepherds back then worked in what was called as communal flocks. The flocks belong to the community. And shepherds usually worked in threes. Somebody had the morning shift, somebody had the swing shift, and somebody had the night shift. So on your shift, if the sheep went astray, it was your job oh, yeah. when the next shift started to leave the 99 and go find the one that got lost yeah. on your watch. Yeah. Somebody holler my watch. Yeah. So when he's telling this parable, everybody at the party understands exactly the meaning of leaving the 99 and going after the one sheep. Fourthly, I see in this passage that he describes what happens when he finds the lost sheep. The Bible says when he has found it, look at this family, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Did you see it? When he finds it, he picks it up and he carries it back to the fold. I like this because it gives you and I a picture of the fatigue of the sheep and the compassion of the shepherd. Uh, the shepherd doesn't allow the sheep to walk back home. He doesn't scold it because it wanders off. He carries it back home. Now remember, it was his appetite that made it wander away, but it's the good shepherd that brings it back. <laughs> oh, that's just good news right there. I like this because uh, what a beautiful intimate picture of a loving shepherd who must carry a wandering, wayward, appetite-driven lost sheep back to where it needs to be. This is powerful because Jesus is telling this illustration because those tax collectors and sinners are seen as God's property and they wandered away from their creator. He's telling the story because he wants them to know I'm the good shepherd and I've come to find those who have wandered away. Well, I'm almost out of my chaplain minutes, but we've looked at the shepherd who receives. We've looked at the shepherd who rescues. Let me land the plane now and show you the shepherd who rejoices. The Bible says that when he finds the lost sheep, he comes home, he calls together his friends, neighbors, and says to them, rejoice with me. I found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you, that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Thank you for listening, family. I'm coming down now. 
Well, let me share this with you. When you come to this last portion of the parable, the good shepherd calls for his friends and neighbors to come and rejoice. Why? Because it's a communal flock. He has to give an account to the community of the one that went astray. This is beautiful because it shows us about a caring community that's waiting and watching for the one sheep to be found. Why is he telling us? He said, heaven is just like this. Heaven is waiting and watching for me to bring all these tax collectors and sinners back home. Oh, what a beautiful picture. He said, I say to you, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner than over 99 of y'all who don't need to repent. What a comparison here of the righteous and those who are lost. He says there'll be joy in heaven, rejoicing. And here's what I learned about this passage. Just arrested me, Sister Julia. Heaven values sinners. They value those who are lost, those communities that are broken, those ones we won't drive through, we won't visit, we won't serve, we don't care about. Somebody cares about them. They care so much that God sent his only begotten son to come down to those communities to reach those lost sheep. I was almost through with this preaching, Reverend Ford, and then the word one jumped out to me. Has that ever happened to you when you read the scripture, just one word, just boop? No, I'm the only one? Okay. Heaven rejoices over one. There's some serious significance over the number one. Dr. Riken, it tells me that it doesn't take much for heaven to rejoice. Just one. Brother Haas, one person can cause glory to erupt in jubilation. It also says how much value there is in one life being changed, one life being redeemed, one life being born again. Just one soul saved can capture the community in glory. Here it is. Look at, look at the significance of one with me, and I promise I'm through. When God got ready to build his church, one man was named the father of many nations. When God got ready to destroy the earth, one man was righteous in his eyes to build an ark. Noah was his name. When God got ready to deliver Israel from bondage, one man was required to do the job. Moses was his name. When God slayed the enemies of Israel, one man was chosen for the job. Samson was his name. When God wanted a sister to lead the flock, one woman, Deborah, was made judge. When God called for one intercessor for his people, Esther was given the assignment. I wish I had a little preaching help in here right now. When God defeated the prophets of Baal, one man was called to call down fire. When God got ready to rebuild the walls of the city, one man, Nehemiah, got the job. You see the importance of one? One man slayed Goliath. One man preached and all of Nineveh got saved. One man survived the lion's den. I'm talking about the importance of one. And when it came down to saving all of the world, one man got the job. He was born of a virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes. I'm trying to preach, but y'all won't help me, so let me lay it down. One man gave sight to the blind. One man raised dead folks back to life. One man fed 5,000 with two fish and a few little loaves. One man walked on water and calmed the sea. One man cured the diseases of humanity. I'm talking about the importance of one. And one man on one Friday, on one hill, outside of Jerusalem. One man was stretched high and dropped low. One man died that all men might be saved. Oh, come on, help me preach, we. 
One man went into the grave. One man took the sting out of death, victory over the grave. And one Sunday morning, that one man with all power got up from the dead so that you now could be witnesses on the one man army. Is there anybody here that know who I'm talking about today? He's a good shepherd. And I'm so glad he's a good shepherd because that one man one day found me lost and separated in sin. Y'all know where I was? Inside of an institution. I'm so glad Jesus visits institution. Now mine was a juvenile correctional facility, but he came in, forgave me of my sins, cleansed me, wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you didn't even know your chaplain knew the man. My question is, do you know the man? Is there anybody here that knows the man this morning? I said, is there anybody here that knows the man? Somebody say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Let's stand for the benediction as our president prays over us.